If you've ever listened to two audio humans that really know what they're talking about, describing the way a different processor makes something sound different, can feel like they are from another dimension. They're <laughs> talking about words that you have no idea what they even mean or even how to perceive it. So if you've ever been in one of those conversations and thought, yeah, no, this video is for you. Perception in audio is a tricky thing because sometimes there's things that you think you hear, but actually there was no change at all and it's the exact same signal. Or other times you hear somebody talking about how something sounds way different, but to you it all sounds the same. So how do you develop your ear to hear changes in different audio processors so that you can actually identify what it is and then use that same processor skillfully in the instance when it needs it? Hey, if you're new here, my name is James Attaway and I help the church sound techs worship leaders, and tech directors eliminate the mystery and frustration around Sound at Church, and we're going to dive a little bit more into that mystery here today. If that's you, go ahead and hit subscribe, and welcome to the Club of Sound Ninjas. We'll get to the lesson in just a second, but here's another one you might have experienced. The phantom knob turn, right? You're messing with something, you're tweaking it on the soundboard, you're like, oh, I think that sounds better. And then suddenly you find out you're on the wrong channel, or the processor isn't even on. Yeah, I've been there too, so if you have, go ahead and mash that like button. So how are we gonna actually identify when we can hear a change with a certain processor? It could be your EQ, your compressor, or something fancy like a saturator plug-in or something else. When we're making changes between one processor and another one, our brain doesn't have that long of an audio memory, or we forget what something sounded like very quickly. So if we have to twiddle a bunch of knobs to get one setting back to a different one, that can be a problem, and then it's harder to really identify what is this, say, frequency band doing on our EQ. That's one of the things that I really like about the PreSonus Studio Live consoles, is you can bypass individual bands of the EQ on and off without having to turn off the entire EQ, or twist the gain knob back to zero and then put it back again. The beginner level is to do this with instruments by themselves, so that you can identify how the instrument sounds different when you make the EQ change. The advanced way to do it is to listen in context of another instrument or your entire mix. Like what happens when we cut out 400 on the kick drum while we're listening to the bass guitar? One of the best ways to eliminate perception bias when we're testing out different pieces of equipment is to do a blind A-B test. Of course, doing that in live sound is tricky for a few reasons, one of which is that we're usually relying on an instrumentalist that's playing their instrument, and there could be little changes between what they're doing in different parts, say they're strumming on the neck and maybe they're strumming closer to the bridge, or they hit the piano harder on some notes than other notes this time than they did last time. That in itself makes it trickier, so we want to try to eliminate as many variables as possible. One of the ways that you can do that is with a virtual sound check where you record the performance and then you can loop a section of it to hear that same spot different ways with your different processors. Another thing you have to do to make sure that you're getting accurate perception is to make sure that the two signals that you're listening to are level matched. I talk about this all the time on this channel, but the Fletcher Munson curve is the way that our ears change in our perception of relative frequencies at different overall levels. So when something gets louder, we perceive more bass and more treble. So when we're trying to bypass a compressor to see if we like how it's making it sound, we have to make sure that the levels are matched so that we can accurately hear what tone or what change the compressor is making. So we can turn our kick EQ all the way off. Hear the difference there. Or we can just turn off individual bands. That's what I like about the PreSonus Studio Live 32. So we can do that. An advanced technique though is to listen to the kick and EQ it while also listening to a related instrument like the bass. So listen to how the bass feels different when we turn off the EQ for the kick. And we can do that for individual bands too. Maybe we bump that up a little bit because it's not doing enough for us.
All right, so for the acoustic guitar, this is uncompressed. And we turn on the compressor. We can hear that there's a tone change. But I already have the makeup gain on. If I turn the makeup gain off or down all the way, and we try to compare the compressor on and off, there's a big level change. So, of course, compressed sounds worse. It sounds quieter and farther away and smaller. Right? So using the makeup gain to match that, before you start listening for tone stuff, uh, try to just match the level with on and off. So we're dialing in this. And we'll wait for him to start playing again. So we want the level to be the same whether or not the compressor is in or out. Then we can actually hear what the compressor itself is doing for the tone. The other thing you need to do is check it while it's coming down or differences in the dynamics, right? So the quieter section versus the louder section. Let me see if I can find a part where it comes from loud to quiet. I can play that back for you. So there we were able to turn on the compressor and get the level back up when he started playing quietly again. So we're not just listening for tone changes, we're also listening for the way that it changes between the different parts of their dynamic range. On an EQ, make sure that your bands are targeted enough so that you're not moving the entire overall line down or up by your EQ changes. Often I'll see novice engineers using very wide cuts across a bunch of different bands in order to get the tone that they want or to try to notch out feedback, even though they're kind of sweeping out feedback. And essentially they're just turning the entire thing down. Now you might get to the tone that you want using this method, but then when you bypass the EQ, you get a huge level jump which causes it to feed back. If you don't know how to get out of this pinch, it can really handcuff you and then you don't know how to make any changes without it starting to squeal on you. When I'm trying to listen to what a compressor is doing, I'll dial in my settings and I'll use my fader to push up the level while I'm doing it because the compressor will automatically turn down the signal. I wanna make up some of that by just pushing up the fader real quick. Then after I get the settings dialed in, and I think it might sound good, I will use the makeup gain to turn off the compressor and turn it back on and try to make sure that the levels are matched between when the compressor is in and when the compressor is out of the signal path. Now, another great feature of the Studio Live console, which this video is not sponsored by the way, I just like all these features, is the AB function. It lets you change a bunch of different parameters on both the EQ and compression with just one press of the button. So if you get them level matched, you can actually compare two totally different approaches to using EQ and compression on a single input and just switch back and forth with the press of a button. So when it's on, it's on B. When it's off, it's on A or the normal setting. So here, let's set something up. Let's turn on the compressor and the EQ and we've got this going this way. Instead of making it a brighter guitar, let's maybe Oh, okay, let's switch over to B, because we've got this setting that we've used previously. Let's switch over to B, and maybe we make it less bright, and maybe we add in a little bit more the high mids. Let's get a little more jangly, perhaps. So we'll do that, and then let's change our compression ratio and our attack time, and see what we can do with this. So maybe we do a ratio more like this. Now we'll play it to actually listen to it and hear what it's doing. And then after we get it dialed in, we'll A, B back and forth, and then also make sure that the levels are matched between the two so that we can compare it precisely.
Now you can check that in the context of the rest of the mix to see how everything fits. You're not having to change a whole bunch of things, you're just able to hit one button. So let me unmute the rest of this and we'll take a listen. So to me, uh, one of them sounds, again, more jangly and we get a little bit more of the sustain of the notes, whereas the other one, it feels more like a shaker with chords. So we've got different tonal options that we can try and we wouldn't have found that out very quickly if we couldn't quickly A, B it in the midst of the entire mix as well. So great feature from PreSonus, super pumped to have that, especially for teaching you guys. On the Yamaha consoles, you've got a compare function as well. So for each one of your processors, if you hit compare, it selects what setting you have and puts that in the copy buffer. Then you can make changes and hit compare again and it'll swap back. This is one way that you can teach people different approaches to EQing, say vocals or guitars or pianos, and really figuring out which one fits better in the context of the mix without having to make tons of changes on lots of little knobs. Now, if you're trying this and you can't tell a real difference or you can't perceive what's being changed, try to ask somebody else because sometimes their fresh perspective of not being myopic on this one signal might be able to perceive what changes and they might feel it differently than you do. You might be trying to listen to something in the frequency domain where the change is really in the time domain. Speaking of getting myopic, sometimes we can get so hyper-focused on one channel and one part of a channel in our mix that we forget to take a step back and listen to the big picture of the mix. If you need to step away from the console for a few minutes and come back with fresh ears, definitely take a couple minutes and do that. Ask yourself, how does it feel overall? What emotion am I getting from the way that this mix feels? And are there any things that are out of place that are kind of glaringly obvious that I've gotten used to and ignored over the last few minutes? Now, when you're trying to blind A-B test, something that's a little less conspicuous or you're not exactly sure what it does, again, make sure that the levels are matched, whether it's on or off. And one thing I like to do is close my eyes and tap the button a bunch of times so that I don't know whether it's on or off. And then keeping my eyes closed, I'll, again, tap bypass, tap engage, and see if I can hear and articulate what the differences are. That was especially helpful for me when I was testing out the tube emulation on the Allen & Heath SQ series preamps. When we're getting into some of these processors, and sometimes it's analog compressor emulations or things like tube or saturation things, we can try to attach different language to it so that we know what the feeling is from this technology. And I get it, it's kind of weird assigning a circuit to a feeling, but it really happens. And if you listen to A-list recording engineers and mix engineers, they really can tell a difference and get a certain feeling from an input and paint a different picture with a different compressor or a different type of EQ. Does it feel good? Of course it does, but don't get all prideful about it. It's a learned skill and you didn't have it at one point and others might not have it now and they might develop it in the future. So don't think of yourself more highly than you should. I guess that's what I'm saying. Don't outsound ninja somebody else just because you can't. So here are some other words that I and others have used to describe different processors with their distortion characteristics or their compression characteristics. And you can do with it what you want, but don't be surprised when you hear somebody talking this way. There's aggressive, full, warm, big, thin, weak, wide, even if it's in mono, sometimes things can feel wider. I don't exactly know why, but there's that one. There's focused, tight, flabby, and punchy. And if you're a guitar player or a bass player, you've probably experienced some of these things too. As you use the different pieces of gear and pickups and different pedals, it can really be very different in the way that things sound. And you kind of put strange words to it, but that's what we do. We're talking about music, we're talking about sounds. So there's some artistic stuff that goes along with it. Now, if you're wanting to go a little bit deeper into the way that some of these compressors and vintage compressors feel, I made a video about input and output compressors that you can find in plug-in form, both on some consoles and in your digital audio workstation or 
plugin form. I'll throw links to those videos down in the description below. Hey, if you liked this video and you want to see more stuff like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give that thumbs up to help the algorithm and help other church sound techs find videos like this that can be helpful for them. As always, remember, it's all about the low end, avoid the sound tech solo, and nobody leaves church humming the kick drum. We'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.